going to introduce our first science presentation for the day. And I'm going to ask Dr. Taz Van Omen to come up, who's going to give us an overview of the Million Year Ice Core Project and an overview of this entire Australian climate program. Taz leads our Antarctic climate program at the division. He's a climate scientist specialising in ice cores and glaciology. He's made six different expeditions down to Antarctica for ice core drilling and airborne glaciology surveys. His research on ice cores has identified a link between Antarctic snowfall and drought here in Australia. Over to you, Taz. Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll grab some water. I'm a little dry. Great. It's a real pleasure to be here today and thank you, Nicole, for that introduction and for setting up the talk so beautifully with all that information that really gives you a, an overview of the program. I want to begin by stepping back for a moment. This image, and many like it, of course, are familiar to us. In December this year, will be uh, 50 years old. It's the first image that was taken by um, crewed NASA missions that had the entire Earth in a single frame, sometimes known as the blue marble, it's credited as a turning point in our understanding and popular perception that we live on an Earth that is an integrated system. And it's that system I want to talk about today. In fact, all the talks you'll be hearing today really look not just at Antarctica, but how Antarctica fits in the global system, how it influences and responds to that global system. And so, if we look at that blue marble image, 50 years on, 49 years, this is last year, we see that the blue marble looks remarkably similar to what it did 50 years ago, but it's not. It's changed and we've affected it. That change amounts to something like 90 parts per million of extra CO2 and about 0.9 degrees warming since 1972. Those changes now change the way that Antarctica sits in the climate system. We need to understand how those changes are going to change the way Antarctica responds and how that influences the rest of the continent, or the rest of the planet, pardon me. I like these images too because when you look at them, you see Antarctica in summertime. You see the reflection of the white of Antarctica reflecting radiation to space. You see the Southern Ocean clouds allowing sunlight in places through to the Southern Ocean. These processes are critical to actually controlling the climate of the planet. And you've heard it said that Antarctica plays a pivotal role in the climate system. There are several reasons why it does so. One of these is the fact that it's situated in this wide Southern Ocean. The Southern Ocean that's connected, in fact, to all of the other ocean basins and the currents that drive the ocean circulation make Antarctica almost a Piccadilly Circus in the ocean system. You can see the red current that goes around Antarctica, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, the largest in the world. What you can't see in this simplification are the cold, dense currents that get driven off the coast of Antarctica and fill the abyssal ocean. All of this connectivity is what makes Antarctica critical to the global system at least a part of it. And incidentally, when you hear me later on talk about ice cores, it's partly the reason why Antarctic temperatures connect and reflect the global temperatures as a whole. There are other reasons why Antarctica is so important. Like the northern polar regions, it's the region where the Earth's energy balance is such that we lose energy to space. So Antarctica is critically important in regulating the planet's energy balance and it's the flow of heat from low latitudes to high latitudes in the ocean and atmosphere that actually drive many of the processes that we need to understand. And so if we look to this very popular 
illustration, we get to see Antarctica at the top of the planet where it belongs. And we can see around there again, not just the clouds, but an element that we've mentioned or Nicole mentioned briefly, and that's the sea ice zone. More than doubling the white area around the continent every maximum in late spring, around about September. That's a, an additional important element of the climate system that you'll be hearing more about today. So I want to talk about the Antarctic Division's climate program. We break down the program into four highly connected themes because everything in the system is interconnected. First of these is the atmosphere. We look at the Antarctic atmosphere uh, through our observatory at Davis, through satellites uh, and a range of uh, techniques which I'll delve into a little bit more in a moment. We look at sea ice, again remote sensing, we have looking forward to the Noena with the amazing capabilities to expand our sea ice observing. We look at the ice sheets and sea level and try to understand what we're seeing in terms of the changing mass of Antarctica. And to get the time dimension, we look at past climate from ice cores. And I should mention that all of this work is Im embedded in our partnership, the, in the Australian Antarctic Program Partnership. And that partnership is crucial to provide the breadth and the depth necessary to address these questions. And the questions we address are really critical. We're looking at the gaps in our understanding, gaps that are identified by the IPCC, by World Climate Research Program, World Meteorological Organisation, peak bodies, the things in the climate system that relate to the high latitudes in the south that we just don't understand well enough. And what does that matter? Why is that important? Well, it's filling those gaps, it's learning those things that actually allows us to deliver better projections of future climate, to deliver the physical understanding that will lead to improved weather forecasting so that we can understand what's happening now in Australia for the national good. I want to just give you now some cameos of some of the work that we're doing in these programs. And the first one's in the atmospheric space, looking at climate and weather model challenges. Here we see a map that shows the southern hemisphere, or shows the globe actually, but what you notice is in the southern hemisphere, there's a large band of yellow. This is depicting the radiation balance seen in the models, the radiation that reaches the surface of the Earth, and it's actually the anomaly. So how far is the radiation balance um, out of predict or out of sync with the observations and the models. And we see in the southern hemisphere that there's a radiation imbalance which is actually making the surface too warm. So the models are allowing too much radiation to reach the southern ocean. Now we believe we understand part of why that is the case. Turns out that actually the southern ocean clouds are really hard to predict and not like clouds in the rest of the planet. The mix of supercooled water and ice actually is quite different. The properties are different. My colleagues in the atmospheric space tell me that uh, since AR5, the biases here have been reduced, but quite possibly not because of the right reasons. So we really need to understand these processes. Other areas that, uh, another area that Nicole has mentioned is our work looking at ozone depletion and recovery. Here we see the ozone hole um, as of last July, last September, beg your pardon, and you, we know that that Antarctic ozone hole is closing with time. The Montreal Protocol is actually working and you can see the observations and the models there showing us turning the corner, if you will, to ozone recovery with still several decades to go. It's critical we understand this because in fact the ozone hole itself drives climate change, particularly the southerly migration of the westerlies the so-called strengthening of southern, southern annular mode, uh, which actually moves the storm tracks further south and strengthens the winds. That has a dramatic effect on the weather of the southern hemisphere. And so understanding that, how the recovery inter interacts with similar effects driven year round by the increase in carbon dioxide is a critical part of our, un our ongoing mission. 
And in fact, the work we do is closely connected with many of you or some of you here in Canberra working in the ozone uh, Montreal protocol space and our scientists have worked uh, on this, this, um, these reports. Turning to sea ice, which you've heard a little bit about, sea ice is crucial not just because of its physical properties. The physics of sea ice obviously reflects radiation to space. It also provides a barrier between the relatively warm ocean, which is near freezing point, say minus one or minus two degrees Celsius, and the very cold atmosphere above, which may be minus 20 or minus 30 degrees. These physical changes are really important. It also drives deep ocean currents, which I mentioned earlier on, as the sea ice is formed. But sea ice is critically important for other reasons too. It provides a substrate for the growth of primary productivity. You can see phytoplankton and algae, which then form food for the bottom of the food chain, uh, like the krill that you can see there, and in fact, a refugia for these species um, over winter, not to mention a platform for many species like seals um, and penguins. So the sea ice actually is critically important, not just physically, but for the uh, ecosystem, for the whole Earth system. Turning, I beg your pardon, on sea ice, there's an incredibly important problem that we don't understand, and you'll hear more about this from Rob Massam later on. What we see in the Arctic here is the inexorable decline in the red curve of sea ice over the satellite observing period. What you can see in the blue curve in fact, is the sea ice in the Antarctic, which has shown variability but not much change. If anything, a slight increase up until about uh, 2015. And then there's been a large drop in sea ice, and in fact, this year is also much below normal. The problem here is we don't understand why the Antarctic sea ice changes has, are as they have been seen. Models do a better job in the Arctic, but models really can't reproduce what we see in the Antarctic. And the IPCC has identified this as a critical gap. Uh, and again, using our new observing capa capabilities with Noena, we are very much looking forward to addressing this problem. I want to turn next to the continent. Here we see Antarctica. And what I like about this is it very really clearly shows the transantarctic mountains cutting up through the continent with West Antarctica on your left, a much smaller ice sheet, and the larger East Antarctic ice sheet on your right about 10 times the volume or sea level equivalent to West Antarctica. And in fact, if we peel some of that ice off, showing you what's underneath parts of East Antarctica, you can see that it's got mountains and valleys uh, with deep, deep troughs that go down to several thousand, or at least 2,000 metres or more below sea level. The red arrow, keep in mind, is where the million year ice core is going to be drilled. I'll come back to that in a moment. That ice wall, that cliff that we've cut away would be two to three kilometres high in most places. So there's a great deal of ice lying over the top of those deep basins in Antarctica. And if we look down on it, we can see that all the blue areas of Antarctica are where the ice rests on bedrock below sea level. And these areas are particularly vulnerable because as a warming climate causes melt and the oceans are able then to follow the ice sheet inwards to the continent. Worse than that, in places where the bedrock slopes down as you go inland, there is possibility of runaway, unstable retreat, where in fact once you cross a certain threshold, the ice sheet uh, is committed to retreat further still. And you can see that while West Antarctica has been a focus of much attention, Let's see if I can use the laser, Oh, that's helpful. Good. So we can see there West Antarctica with a great area below sea level. East Antarctica has these really large deep basins that are below sea level. The Aurora Subglacial Basin and the Wilkes Subglacial Basin, each of these capable of delivering as much sea level rise as West Antarctica in total. And we need to understand what's happening. In fact, if we look at observations, we can see satellite observations of mass loss over the last, well, up to 2016. I draw your attention to the losses we're seeing in West Antarctica, but then you'll see that we're starting to see mass loss in East Antarctica. 
large glacial drainage areas that we don't understand well and that have great capacity to deliver um, large sea level rises over the longer term. And so if you look at the IPCC projections, you can see there the cluster of coloured scenarios. What I want to draw your attention to is that the IPCC made the point that there's this high limit of low likelihood but high impact potential for melt from Antarctica to drive very large sea level rises. And indeed, the world doesn't end at 2100. IPCC for the first time formally looked beyond 2100 and actually by 2300 the high level scenarios could deliver 7 metres or indeed as much as 15 metres under some scenarios of sea level rise. In a sense I'm almost more concerned that by 2300 even the low scenarios deliver over 3 metres of sea level rise. So we're looking at a dramatically changed world and we don't understand the extent to which that's possible at this point. Finally, I want to turn to what we know from the past. Here we see a beautiful snowy surface on Antarctica and each one of those snowflakes carries with it messages about climate in the past, whether it's contaminants stored in the water or the isotopic signatures of the water or the air bubbles that get trapped between the water. They get laid down in layers, which actually we can drill into and that's essentially how ice scoring works. This has been a long-standing program in which Australia has had a leading role with our deep Lord Ohm ice core record, which I'll refer to shortly. In fact, the Lord Ohm ice core record has produced the iconic, most detailed record of CO2 increase uh, pre-industrial that exists because of the special properties of that particular drilling site. We can see very clearly over the last millennium the variability in CO2 and the dramatic rise through industrialisation. Even more so, we can use special tools that tell us the fingerprint of the carbon, the carbon isotopes. And that curve shows carbon-13 variations. You can see the dilution of carbon-13 in the global atmosphere as we start to burn fossil fuels. If you put that information together from what we know about plants, ocean and terrestrial biosphere, we can actually then partition and understand where that carbon is going and coming from in the global system. Another area of work that Nicole referred to is our work linking uh, rainfall in Australia to what we see in Antarctica. In this map we can see wind arrows, we can see a red cross on the coast of Antarctica where our ice core is located and the colours here show moist air in blue and dry air in brown. What we were able to find is a connection between the climate on the coast of Antarctica and drought in Western Australia. And in fact, we were able to find a significant correlation which then allowed us to use the ice core record of snowfall to tell us about how West Australian drought looked in the longer term. Pause that thought. Because what we also have done is looked at other signatures in the ice core. In this case, we looked at not the snowfall, but the winds themselves and how much salt ended up landing in the ice core. And we find a correlation, a correlation between the saltiness in the ice and droughts in eastern Australia. Thank you. And what we see then is that drought is unusual in Western Australia. The instrumental record is not reflective of the long term. East Australia has had mega droughts in the past and because time's against me, I'll keep moving, and decadal scale patterns matter. In a meteorological record that's only a century long, we've only got a few cycles of the Pacific decadal oscillation. That's not enough to tell what happens in the long term. So I encourage you to come and talk to me or read the papers. Turning now to the long term and the million year ice core, we can see here the longest ice core record available of CO2. This comes from the European Dome Sea ice core. 800,000 years of CO2. And you can see the ice ages with cold, low CO2 periods when the northern hemisphere was covered by thick ice sheets. And you can see warm periods like the one that we're currently in. What you can also see is 
that CO2 now is vastly well be beyond anything seen in the 800,000 year record. The ice core can also give us the temperature record, which is to do with its connectivity with the rest of the planet. And what we see is that global temperatures and CO2 are tightly coupled. The interesting thing is that we want to know what happens further back, and I'll tell you why. The red and black curves here are the same two curves of CO2 and temperature that you've seen. The blue curve on the bottom comes from ocean sediments. The ocean sediment record we can take back further already, and it shows us that the ice age cycles of global temperature looked remarkably different. As Nicole said, in the early period, they beat at a 40,000 year period, faster, shallower than the deep, slower cycles during the ice core record. What we don't understand is what caused the change, and that's pretty concerning if you think you understand the climate system. So what we want to do is take the ice core records back as far as they can go. What was CO2 doing before this transition? Did, was it still coupled with global temperature? And what does that mean for the long-term impacts of the grand experiment we're doing on the planet at the moment? So we're going to drill an ice core at Little Dome Sea, 1,200 kilometres inland from Casey. We're going to get there with some of this kit that you've seen on the rolling video when you came in, and it's a pretty exciting time with our first team going out this season. I'll just show you now, this is the kind of technology we've had to develop in our technology and innovation section, have built a world-class deep ice core drill that's going to take us to nearly three kilometres deep in the ice sheet. Not unlike this baby drill that we use for single summer seasons when we're only going a few hundred metres. And the way we drill ice cores, you can see here, we just lower the drill in, drill for a couple of metres, pull the ice core up, bring it out, and then bag it and bring it back to Australia for analysis. So it's all very simple, really. <laughs> so I want to finish where we started looking at planet Earth, and particularly about the lessons and challenge before us. Many of you have seen this quote, but I love it, from Nobel Prize winner F. Sherwood Rowland. What's the use of having developed science well enough to make predictions if in the end all we're willing to do is sit around and wait for them to come true? And from John Holdren, a White House advisor under Obama, we basically have three choices, mitigation, adaptation and suffering. We're going to do some of each. The question is what the mix is going to be. The more mitigation we do, the less adaptation will be required and the less suffering there will be. And that's a pretty strong call to action, I think, as a scientist. Thank you.